Uh, thanks again. That was uh, quite sobering. Um, so let's get right to it. I know there's a lot on your minds, and I, th I think uh, we have two great people here who are going to uh, bring it forward for us. Um, so let's uh, get to the stage. Maureen Down. Come on up. And from the Washington Post, Manuel Roig Francia. Wow, I think we all need a drink. <laughs> I do. You know, watching all this um, film about wine, of course, made me think of baseball. You know, at the baseball game, when a guy has his first major league hit or throws a no-hitter, somebody goes and grabs the ball and brings it off to the side there, and there's a guy standing there He's the authenticator, and he puts a little sticker on the ball, and that makes it official. What is the wine industry doing to make their product uh, reliable uh, so that buyers can feel comfortable that they're purchasing something real? You know, to date, um, a lot of different people have tried to tackle this in a lot of different ways. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of micro writing, holograms, and RFID chips being used. Um, RFID chips kind of make me laugh as a, as a sole what, answer, I guess. Um, having grown up in Silicon Valley uh, in semiconductors, my father used to get angry because um, before AMD could get a chip off the line, it was already being counterfeited. So I don't see that RFID chips are, are the future. Um, but we are about to put out a blockchain-based solution that kind of melds some of the different things together. The only thing that can be done right now is layering and tracking provenance. Is it possible that fraudulent wine can still be delicious? <laughs> you know, there are two answers to that, yes and no. Oh. <laughs> so it can be if you're not thinking about it. So, for example, Miraval Rosé is the Brad and Angelina tragedy. Um, <laughs> the, their rosé is highly counterfeited all over the world. And um, some of the counterfeits taste great. But if what you want to have is the Brangelina rosé, then um, you're not actually tasting their wine. So... You mean there's a possibility that the Miraval that is in our Georgetown social Safeway here in the really cool round bottle is not real? If you flip it upside down and you look in the punt and it's embossed Miraval, then you've got a real one. Wow. Okay. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us about Rudy. Uh, what were the early signs? I know you were on this uh, probably before anyone. What was it that made you suspicious? So um, I knew that he was counterfeiting wine in 2002. Um, nobody wanted to, to believe me. I was one of the only women in the auction industry. But the reason um, that I knew it was because um, in 2001, he was still drinking California Merlot. And in 2002, he started, he brought me a bunch of 1950 Lafleur and Petrus uh, bottled by Van der Meulen. Um, this is a Belgian negociant. It's not something that you see every day. So it's kind of the equivalent of going from riding a big wheel to all of a sudden driving a Ferrari. And that's just not a leap that you make that quickly. Um, so I asked him for receipts. And here is the big thing. And here is why, well, there's a, a number of reasons why his accomplices should be in jail. But, um, you know, in the modern era, if you purchase something, you're, you've got bank statements, you've got credit card statements. There are a number of different ways that you can track your purchases. There's no reason that Rudy shouldn't have been able to come up with receipts. He couldn't come up with a receipt. So he, send up, he sent me a fax of a fax of a fax in Chinese. And I said that that wasn't good enough. And he never again tried to sell through me. Um, and you know, these guys were my friends. John Capon was my first friend in New York. When I moved to New York, I lived on 72nd Central Park West. So his store was right down the street. He was my first non-work friend. I worked at Tavern on the Green. So um, 
you know, we used to be good buddies, which is another reason that this kills me so much. Um, but, you know, I knew from that point that Rudy had to be full of shit because, you know, he, you don't start amassing all this wine and not be able to produce receipts. Another big thing is that this myth that Rudy was spending a million dollars a month on wine, that is not true. Rudy was not buying a lot at auction. He was bidding a lot at auction. So he would go to an auction and he would raise his paddle and it would look like he was buying $500,000 but he would actually only end up purchasing about 30,000. He would default on the rest of it, and it, it would end up having to be reoffered. So he had a no bid position um, at a number of different auction houses at any given time. Wait, if he was defaulting, how come word didn't get around did. that this guy was up to something sneaky? It did. And what happened when word got around? Um, John Capon kept promoting him. You know, one of the things that they didn't show here is he, he was in debt, Rudy was in debt to John Capon for 10 million, but John Capon also got his clients to loan Rudy millions of dollars. If you look at Rudy's post-sale reports, Joe Wender loaned him a million dollars. Um, Bob Bishop loaned him $2 million. Blattman loaned him, uh, loaned him a million dollars. Eric Greenberg loaned him. And it says, you know, interest on Wender loan, right? And they're all public documents. Well, I assume that these are sophisticated people, people who have a lot of money, people who have dealt with complicated financial tra transactions. People who are partners at Goldman Sachs. People who are partners at Goldman Sachs. Oh, <laughs> that's a whole other documentary, isn't it? <laughs> Why would they fall for it? And why did they? I don't know. Why did Jay McInerney, and why is Jay McInerney still drinking with those guys? He likes to go on the TV shows and be in the movie, but he's still sitting at the table with them when you go to an auction. What about Rudy? What was his motivation? Did you get any sense about why he was doing this? Was it simply about money, or was there something else going on? You know, he's a con man. You know, I think, I think, the, this is the only way that I can explain this, because people always ask, what do you think he was thinking? I don't think that people who aren't criminals can understand what criminals think. Like, I just don't think that you and I can understand the mind of a criminal because we don't have criminal minds. Like, I don't understand what motivates somebody to do certain crimes. My brain doesn't work that way, you know? But I'm really interested in unraveling the crime. You know, I mean, I'm fascinated with figuring out how Rudy made the labels. Like, I disagree that it took an hour, you know, at a time. I'm learning how he baked his labels and how he, he did the aging and stuff like that. But I can't, I can't tell you what the motivation was. I mean, you know, these guys thought they were really his friends and he's sitting there duping them out of millions of dollars. David Doyle bought like $30 million worth of wine from him. Wow. Wow. Right. <laughs> Directly from him, not even through an auction house. I mean, Rudy sold about $130 million worth of wine that we can tell, which is in today's market worth about $550 million. That's how much of Rudy's wine is out there. And as Jay McInerney says, yeah, John Capon, great guy. He'll take it back. He has not destroyed any of it. It's so, still out there. So you're saying we could still go buy some Rudy wine uh, this afternoon? <laughs> Anybody, yeah. can we take up a collection? Yeah. No, I mean, because I deal, you know, my clients all the time when I, when I you know, make my, my, my firm, when we do a report, um, my clients have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. They get their money back. You know, they'll get a million dollars back for counterfeit wine. I've got a client right now who has a million dollars worth of counterfeit wine. It's 57 bottles. He'll get his money back, and the firm will take the bottles back. What do you think they're going to do? Destroy them? I don't know. You tell us. I think they're going back on the market. Wow. Is, is it just, uh, take, walk us through the process a little bit when you're trying to figure out what a fake bottle of wine is. What are, what are the first things that you're looking for? What's the, uh, what's the tell? You know, the first thing is just, is it logical? You know, like, really, does, you know, does the face match the body? Um, because sometimes the label will be too pristine or the capsule will be 
too pristine. I mean, these the pieces, the different pieces of the of the um, of the bottle have to have grown up together. You know, so if this thing is supposed to be 50 years old, all the pieces need to look like they're 50 years old. Um, so that's kind of the simple part. And then there's the more forensic part, like like Bill Koch was saying. You know, is there evidence of of glue that was that's too new, or paper? Um, in the 1950s, they started to use a chemical in paper called ultra white. Um, it fluoresces under a blue light. So if you have paper that's supposed to be from the 20s, 30s, or 40s, and it fluoresces under a blue light, bam, you know, the paper's wrong. Or if you look at it under magnification and you can see pixelation from computer production, you know, they didn't, they didn't really have laser printers or dot matrix printers in the 40s. So there's a lot of simple stuff like that. And then um, you can consider food packaging laws and things like that. And this is, a, this is one of my favorites that Rudy got wrong all the time. There was a, a law passed in 1930 in France where the contents of any food package had to be part of the package. So you know how all wine labels have like the size embossed on them? So that had to be part of the package starting in 1930. So if you've got a bottle in 1945 and it doesn't say 750 ml, then it's not real. So all sorts of little things like that. Are there other Rudy's out there? Yes. Just this week, um, we found new sources of Rumier and, um, who is it? It's Rumier and somebody else. Emmanuel Rouget getting counterfeited out of Belgium into France. And two weeks ago, we found new Dugat P. Unfortunately, in the wake of Rudy, um, because so many people profited so much, what we've actually seen is an uptick in global fine wine counterfeiting. Oh, because they were saying, if this guy can make a yep. mint doing this, why not me? Yep. And where's the counterfeiting activity taking place? Is it in the United States or is it in the financial centers internationally? Um, I'm seeing it more in Italy, Belgium, France, and Asia. You know, you know, those of us who are interested in wine fraud have read this book, The Billionaire's Vinegar, which was all about a German guy who was accused of also perpetrating a big fraud like he this. He to sue me three days ago, by the way. Oh, really? Party road okay, well, tell us. Yeah. He got angry because I said in a German, to a German magazine, not that he was a counterfeiter, but that he got his counterfeit sediment wrong. Hmm. That's what he wanted me to retract. He wanted me to retract that I got, that he got sediment wrong, not that he was a counterfeiter. Well, well for those who haven't read the, <laughs> <sighs> you know what? Pride and craft, right? Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. Uh, what was it? Intense arts and crafts, I think was the, <laughs> they said in the, in, in the film. But for those who aren't familiar with this fella and the book that I mentioned, just Give us a brief de uh, description of what he's been accused of doing over the years. So those Bill Coke, Thomas Jefferson bottles, um, those were Hardy Rodenstock creations. Hardy Rodenstock um, was the big counterfeiter that we know of prior to Rudy Kurniawan. Um, Hardy Rodenstock also, by the way, is not his real name. It's Meinhard Georg. So I think that if you want to be a wine counterfeiter, figure out your stage name. Um, and so Hardy is a German man, and he, he used to have these big fantastical tastings, and um, he was very, uh, not unlike John Capon and Rudy, one of the things that he did is he tasted big critics. Um, Rudy was very much substantiated by having Alan Meadows um, attend a lot of tastings and even travel through Asia to, to help sell um, a lot of big sellers with, with Acromero. And um, likewise, Hardy Rodenstock uh, would come over and with real wine merchants, he would taste big wines with Robert Parker. And Robert Parker would bring them 100 points. And then um, all of a sudden, there would be a lot of them available on the US market and people would go crazy. So um, the world right now is still loaded with ancient bottlings of Lafitte and you can that Hardy Rodenstock made. Very ancient in some cases. Okay, so walk us through this. You're a wine counterfeiter. You've got a bunch of rich guys from Wall Street who you've invited over 
to drink? How do you roll out the plonk or how do you roll out the, the stuff that you've cheated on? Is it at the beginning, the middle, the end, or is there a system? Probably the end. I mean, you know, one of the things that good old Hollywood Jeff, isn't he a peach? Um, Do you have his number, by the way, because we, we have, we'd like to visit. You want to yeah. party with him? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so Holly, is that mine? Thank you. So Hollywood Jeff, um, as he said, these guys would drink, and they still do. They're still doing it. Uh, you know, they'd drink $200,000 worth of wine in a night. You know, and they'd say, oh, Rudy was an amazing taster. Yeah, it's because he made the stuff. You know, okay, so he recognized his own children. Well done. <laughs> um, you know, so what I think that what they would do is they would, you know, they'd, they'd drink some of the, the more authentic stuff in the beginning and come on, by the 40th bottle, really? <laughs> the other thing is nobody knows what a lot of these wines taste like. So, you know, you get these guys together and they all think they're ballers and none of them are going to call each other out. So they decided that that's what the wine tasted like. And once Rudy had them all convinced that that's what the wine tasted like, guess what? That's what the wine's going to taste like. Just like Robert Parker decided that, that Hardy Rodenstock's wine is what it tasted like, and now that's what Rudy based his blends on. But these guys seem like fun. I mean, are you saying we wouldn't enjoy an evening out of drinking fake wine with them? Do you like hookers? <laughs> hmm. That is also another documentary. Yeah. <laughs> so they weren't? You're saying they, these weren't entertaining evenings? Depends on what you're into. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, you know, hey, they, they, they enjoy themselves. What can you say? Can you taste the difference between a 1945 fill-in-the-blank Chateau Ycam and a 1946? You know, a bottle variation is something that's actually really, really real. And that's one of the reasons that um, I don't, tasting for authenticity is something that cannot be done to prove a positive. It can only be done to prove a negative. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can definitely taste something and say, this is, this is not correct, but you cannot taste something and say, yeah, this is totally what this is 100%. You can say- Though they do, right? Yeah. yeah I know, mm -hmm. but, James, but James Bond, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can definitely say, yes, this is, you know, this is very much Lafitte, but bottle vary, especially over time, bottle variation is so real. It is, you know, the, the wine is alive in the, in the bottle. And even within a case, you're gonna have so much variation with time that from bottle to bottle within that case, things are gonna be slightly different, which is one thing, by the way, that a lot of counterfeiters depend on. So one of the reasons that we started at auctions, putting, breaking open cases and putting them up, is that what they would do for something like 82 Petrus it, is take four out and replace only four in a case with counterfeits because a lot of collectors would have a case of 12 and they'd take one out and they'd drink it. Oh my God, greatest wine ever. Six months later, have another one. Oh, that's not so good. Bottle variation. Bottle variation. And then take another one. Oh, greatest wine ever. Not realizing that it wasn't bottle variation. They were actually drinking a counterfeit. And it wasn't until we started putting all 12 of them up and being like, wait a minute. You know, and it's the old Sesame Street thing that one of these kids is doing their own thing, right? Some, some of them didn't belong. And that's how we actually started recognizing that the Royal Wine Merchants was a real problem. When the film goes into Bill Koch's unbelievable wine cellar, and you see all of those bottles of wine, and you know that many of them are old, the first thought on my mind was, how many of those bottles of wine, aside from whether they're uh, accurately labeled and true to what he thought they were when he bought them. How many of those bottles of wine are going to suck because they were misstored at some time, stored badly, or something was done wrong with them? I, I always wonder that when I see these giant sellers. Uh, how many have gone bad? Uh, that's a real problem. Um, and then why would you have 40,000 bottles? He's a, he's a crazy yeah. collector. Bill Koch is actually awesome, I gotta tell you. He's hilarious. Um, he just sold 22,000 bottles. He just sold half his collection. He realized he can't drink it all. Um, <laughs> I think he has some volunteers here yeah. who might help, yeah. Um, but you know, that, that is 
That's a, a very good question. It also depends on your palate. So some people have what we call an American palate, and some people have a British palate. Um, people with a British palate, like me, like their wines old and dusty. Um, people with an American palate like their wines younger and juicier. So I kind of, I like them dead. Sometimes they call us necrophiles. I don't know. <laughs> What's the biggest seller you've ever seen private? Um, I manage some pretty big sellers. I manage a collection that's worth about $20 million. And so how many bottles is that? Uh, he's got about 15,000 bottles. 15,000 bottles. Wow. And a person who has 15,000 bottles, are they purchasing those bottles to drink them? Yep. Or to look at them? No. Nope. To drink them? Mm -hmm. How does one go through 15,000 bottles? Well, for one thing, we are generational planning. So we are what? Generational planning. Mm. So we are purchasing with like succession planning, knowing that we're going to be passing them on to his, to his children and grandchildren. The, the grandchildren get the Petrus and, and that's all written up in the will? Well, no, but I, I, I know the plan. <laughs> wow. This is a completely, this is a world that is completely apart from the experiences of most people who are going to the grocery store to buy wine. Hey, I buy wine at Safeway. <laughs> yeah. You do? Sure. Where do you think I get my Miraval? <laughs> the stuff with the punt? <laughs> um, well, look, we want to thank you for coming. Thank you. This is fantastic. Really interesting story, and um, we'll, we'll make sure to uh, be very careful about everything we say when we're around you, because we can tell that you're going to, uh, you'd be able to spot anything that's off even a little bit. Let's give a hand to Maureen. Thank you, thank you all for coming.